he's finally had enough of California. Elon Musk this week announces he's moving his last two headquarters in California to other states, which companies is he moving and why? For the past 22 years, California has been the home of SpaceX, the world's most powerful aerospace company. But times have changed, and a new chapter is beginning. Here's the big announcement that he made on X moving from California to Texas. SpaceX is leaving its birthplace to reach the promised land, where they are building. The gateway to Mars, Starbase, Texas. Exciting opportunities await them there. He has decided he's leaving the state entirely in terms of the headquarters for his companies. You may recall that about two years ago, Elon Musk announced that the cost of operating was so bad in California and politicians have been so toxic to his companies that he moved Tesla from California to Texas. For any company, the headquarters is the brain, the place that directs all activities of the entire system. Elon Musk recently announced the headquarters relocation for his companies, including SpaceX and X. On X, Elon Musk declared, SpaceX will now move its HQ from Hawthorne, California to Starbase, Texas, and added another decision, and X headquarters will move to Austin. This is certainly one of the most important decisions Elon Musk has made in the past few years. Along with these decisions, Musk provided explanations. For X, he primarily cited social security issues, have had enough of dodging gangs of violent drug addicts just to get in and out of the building. As for SpaceX, the catalyst is the new policy announced by California Governor Gavin Newsom. And the Newsom is blaming it all on a law that he just signed. But Elon Musk this week had criticized the law. Signed by Governor Gavin Newsom that will basically bar school districts from notifying parents about any sort of issues or confusion or questions or struggles that their children are having regarding their orientation and identity. That law was deemed to be and rightfully so, observed by Elon Musk and he took to Twitter and said that it was just insane. It's not exactly true that it's just this one law that's causing Musk to leave. According to Elon Musk, this is the final straw. He said that if you value your children, basically you need to flee the state of California. But remember, Musk has been criticizing a whole bunch of things about California, particularly the high taxes, the costly regulations, the anti-business environment, the anti-business attitude that politicians have, the soaring crime, the homelessness, and the crime. He's been talking about all sorts of issues that California has screwed up. He added, because of this law and the many others that preceded attacking both families and companies. In fact, this is not the first time Elon Musk has shown such decisiveness. Musk stated, I did make it clear to Governor Newsom about a year ago that laws of this nature would force families and companies to leave California to protect their children. So Elon Musk says that is the final straw. And again, I'm telling you, it's not just this law. He says, because of this law and many others that preceded it, attacking both families and companies, SpaceX will now move its headquarters from Hawthorne, California to Starbase, Texas. This move also better suits their system since most of SpaceX's main systems are now located on the East Coast. While they only have one Falcon 9, Falcon 9 system on the West Coast, those are the main reasons behind Musk's decision. In recent years, the Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy have continued to uphold SpaceX's industry. Dominance. However, progress remains ongoing, evidenced by increasing annual launch targets, such as this year's goal of 148 flights. In the years ahead, these goals are likely to expand further, maintaining the crucial role of Falcon rockets within SpaceX's system and the aerospace industry at large. Similar to Starship, Falcon rocket systems are now primarily based on the East Coast, with two launch pads in Florida compared to the lone launch pad at Vandenberg Space Force Base on the West Coast. The headquarters relocation will enhance their operational strengths. This heralds a new era worth anticipating, where achievements may surpass limits beyond. Imagination This decision certainly faces numerous challenges. The systems in California, particularly concerning the progress of Falcon rockets, will play crucial roles. Another significant challenge, NASA announced its decision to pick SpaceX to provide a spacecraft capable of deorbiting the International Space Station. However, considering both the unique requirements as well as the necessary power to complete such an important task, 
at the time it wasn't clear what vehicle design the company would use. That was until today, when we were provided graphics along with new details about its design. Earlier today, NASA held a nearly hour and a half long media teleconference, providing updates on the deorbit plan, vehicle, selection. In addition to this, SpaceX posted some information and even graphics. During the teleconference, they provided more context into exactly what the vehicle design includes. In a quote, the manager of NASA's International Space Station program said, The U.S. deorbit vehicle has such a critical function for us. Obviously, it's got to continue to perform critical burns, even if it encounters anomalies. So we require high reliability and a two-fault tolerance approach to the vehicle design. So in the RFP, one of the things we asked for is maximizing the use of heritage flight-proven hardware so we could increase the reliability. She went on to say, of course, there's no existing vehicle that meets the hyperpoles of needs at the U.S. deorbit vehicle. But we certainly can leverage hardware and systems that have been flown and tested in space already. The SpaceX concept leverages the Dragon vehicle, but about half of the vehicle will be a new design and new development, and 100% of the new deorbit functionality is new to the spacecraft, she said. With this in mind, it's clear that the company will be using as much hardware as they can from the Drag. However, at the end of the day, a lot of the capabilities are brand new and as such will require new hardware from SpaceX. In regards to timing and when this vehicle will be ready during the media teleconference, the recorded saying, Ideally, we would have the U.S. deorbit vehicle delivered well in advance at the station's end of life, as Ken mentioned. So the contract has what we call a dwell-in storage requirement, and that it allows us to deliver the vehicle early and then just store and do periodic maintenance on it until we're ready to launch. When we do make the decision to deorbit the station, we'll launch the U.S. deorbit vehicle about one and a half years before the final ranch rebirth. This is an interesting comment as it means this vehicle will be in space for around three years. This definitely has impacts on its design and factors such as power generation and necessary propellant. Going even further in depth, Sarah Walker, the director of Dragon Mission Management at SpaceX said, So the concept of operations for the deorbit vehicle is incredibly complex as Dana described. It requires substantial development to build a vehicle capable of such a mission. So it will ultimately take drive and control of the International Space Station, so to speak, and propel the entire station into a precise deorbit trajectory that terminates in an unpopulated ocean area. So that any elements that could survive atmospheric reentry pose no risk to the public. So to achieve this, the deorbit vehicle will need six times the usable propellant and three to four times the power generation and storage of today's Dragon spacecraft, just for scale. It needs a fuel on board not just to complete the primary mission, but also to operate on orbit in partnership with the space station for about 18 months. She then clarified, first the deorbit vehicle will perform orbit shaping burns to put the station in the low elliptical orbit. And then eventually it will perform a final re-entry burn to lower the perigee to intersect with Earth at the intended location all the while resisting the torques and forces caused by increasing atmospheric drag on the space station. To ensure that it ultimately terminates in the intended location, she said. In reference to the specific design she mentions, so the vehicle design will build upon SpaceX's operational Dragon cargo spacecraft, with an enhanced trunk section that will host propellant tanks, engines, avionics, power generation, and thermal hardware tailored to complete that mission. So almost a spacecraft in and of itself attached there as a new trunk, she said. She finished by highlighting that, while there are a lot of new features, we're going to be able to use a lot of certified technology, such as docking adapters and even the thrusters. This marked the end of the main teleconference portion and it was opened up to questions. One question asked about the image provided by SpaceX in the thruster at the back. Like mentioned in the teleconference, the the orbit vehicle will almost be two spacecraft in one. With the retirement of the station plan for 2030 and the mission goal of launching the spacecraft one and a half years early, it should be ready by around 2028. One of the big challenges will be keeping the spacecraft intact during the deorbit. The International Space Station is primarily made up of a combination of truss elements, modules, solar arrays, and radiators. The truss acts as the backbone of the station providing physical support for the solar arrays, radiators, and modules. The various modules provide pressurized volume for the many microgravity experiments, 
a habitable area for crew, and ports for visiting spacecraft to dock and undock. The solar arrays and radiators provide power generation and thermal control for the station hardware. Related to the burn itself, NASA said, based on behavior observed during the re-entry of other large structures such as Mir and Skylab, NASA engineers expect a breakup to occur as a sequence of three events. Solar array and radiation separation first, followed by breakup and separation of intact modules in the truss segment, and finally individual module fragmentation and loss of structural integrity at the truss. At that point, as the debris continues to re-enter the atmosphere, the external skin of the modules is expected to melt away and expose internal hardware to rapid heating and melting. Most station hardware is set to burn up or vaporize during the intense heating associated with atmospheric re-entry, whereas some denser or heat-resistant components like truss sections are expected to survive re-entry and splash down within an uninhabited region of the ocean. While SpaceX's deorbit vehicle will be needed, NASA wants to naturally lower the station over time as well. The chosen approach for safety commissioning is a combination of natural orbital decay, intentionally lowering the altitude of the station, and the execution of a re-entry maneuver for final targeting and to control the debris footprint. When first announced they highlighted that, this final maneuver is expected to require a new or modified spacecraft using a large amount of propellant. Due to the high propellant requirement of this final maneuver, the Earth's natural atmospheric drag will be used as much as possible to lower the station's altitude while setting up the orbit. Once all crew is safely returned to Earth and after performing small maneuvers to line up the final target ground track and debris footprint over an uninhabited region of the ocean, space station operators will command a large re-entry burn, providing the final push to ensure safe atmospheric entry into the target footprint. We now have a good idea the vehicle SpaceX is building will deorbit the International Space Station. Thanks to the size of the station, SpaceX is building a much larger spacecraft than normal with 46 thrusters. We will have to wait and see how it progresses and the impact it has on the space industry. Thank you very much for watching. And that's about it for today's episode. Thank you so much for tuning in. And that's all for today's update. If you enjoyed watching and found it useful, please make sure to subscribe to my channel and hit the like button. And if you want to support our channel and if you want to be up to date, you can become an exclusive member. So click on our perks through the link in the description below. Thanks to watching and see you next time.